this morning, uh, I want us to look at the two opening sections of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, and we'll find something about why Luke is inspired to write. So let's look at this. Luke begins the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts with a very, very strong affirmation. He makes it very clear. Go ahead and take a look at this. Luke is not giving us his opinion. Okay? He's not. We get opinions all the time. Well, I think this. Well, I think that. Well, that's your opinion. Well, that's your opinion. Luke makes it very clear. He's not giving us his opinion. Luke makes it very clear. He's not telling us a story that someone told somebody, that told somebody else, that told somebody else, that told somebody else, and then he heard it and said, hey, I want you to, I want you to hear this. Luke makes it very, very clear. He says, I'm writing a careful account so that you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. And then in Acts, he says, after Jesus, he says, I began to write, I wrote about all Jesus began to do and to teach. So that means it's going to continue. That's why Acts is an unfinished book. It, Jesus began in the flesh. Jesus continues in the spirit through you and through me. That's what it means. That's what it means. And then he says, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men, these are the disciples, the apostles, and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. They, why does Jesus give convincing proofs to his disciples? Why does he? And why do we need convincing proofs as well? Let's look at them first, and then we will look, then we will look at ourselves and how it applies to us. First of all, he gives them convincing proofs because they have to be convinced for themselves. They have to believe for themselves. I think sometimes we look at the disciples and we're really tough on them, aren't we? How many of you would, how many of you like to, in your thoughts, you judge doubting Thomas? How many of you judge him? You say, I, I know I do. I judge doubting Thomas. If all of the other disciples told me, we have seen Jesus, I would believe them. I would believe them. But if you read scripture in the book of Acts, but you read the ends of the gospels, especially read in Luke, do you know what you will find? You will find Thomas is not the only one who had trouble believing that Jesus was really risen from the dead. And oh, we blame him, don't we? You'll read a little bit later, especially in Luke, because, and Luke is writing this about the convincing proofs. Luke himself says that they were, ve all of them were very slow to believe. They were slow to believe and they were slow to accept that Jesus was really born from, born, uh, risen again from the dead. In fact, remember Mary Magdalene came, she saw Jesus first, and you know what they said? Psh, women talk. Mm, that's what they said, because you can't trust a woman. I'm so glad I did not live at that time. And then the two come, then Peter comes and says, I have seen Jesus. They don't believe him either. Then the two come running back from Emmaus. We have seen him. He has walked with us on the road. They don't believe him either. In fact, when Jesus himself shows up in the room, they have a hard time believing it. In fact, Sarah, go ahead and turn to slide, give, click, click on slide four. Slide four. Let's go. We'll come back to this one. But look at this. It, it tells us so very clearly. They thought they'd seen a ghost. And all of us who think we're such good Christians and say, oh, I would believe, I would believe immediately. No, we wouldn't. We're just like they are. We're just the same as they are. And he says, Jesus says, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your mind? Jesus is standing in front of them, in front of them. And they still don't believe. And he says, look at my hands and my feet. Touch me. Ghosts don't have flesh and bones as you see I, I have. He shows himself. He shows his wounds. And in a way, I think it's partly his wounds that convince them, isn't it? It's his hands and his feet. And that was so clear to them. That was so clear to them. They knew that Jesus had been pierced, had the, the terrible nails had been, had been driven through his hands and through his feet. And when they saw that, that began to convince them. And then he ate 
and that really convinced them further. But they had to have convincing proofs. Brothers and sisters, do you know what? We should be slow to judge the doubting disciples because you and I are very much the same way, aren't we? We really are. We have a hard time believing that God really loves us. Yes or no? Yeah. We have a hard time believing that we are really forgiven when we have prayed and, say, and said, God, forgive me, when we have failed and fallen in an area. Yes or no? Yes. We have a hard time believing God. Jesus, when he says, when he says, um, I will take care of you, trust yourself, trust, cast your cares upon me, I'll care for you. Seek first the kingdom of God and all of these things will be added unto you. How many of you, how many of us are really willing to seek first the kingdom of God? Nope, got to take care of my family, got to make sure everything's okay. We seek other things first and then, oh yes, God, I seek you too. We are so slow to believe. We're so slow to obey. We really are. We're just like the disciples, aren't we? We really are. And so what we see here this morning is good for us as well. And so it tells us, we can go back to slide number two again, that he gives many convincing proofs that he was alive. Why does Jesus give many convincing proofs that he's alive? First of all, and that's in your notes, they have to believe for themselves. They have to believe for themselves. And secondly, they have to have a message to tell an unbelieving world. This is a world that doesn't accept Jesus. This is a world that is hostile to the message of Jesus. This is a world in Jerusalem that has been told, oh, that, that Messiah, that so-called Messiah, that one named Jesus from Galilee, this was the story that they spread. He didn't really rise from the dead. You know why you can't find his body? You can't find his body because the soldiers fell asleep and then the disciples came in while the soldiers were sleeping. They rolled away the big stone, but the soldiers remained sleeping. They went into the tomb, but the soldiers remained sleeping. And then they unwound all of the grave clothes. The soldiers remained sleeping. Then they folded all the grave clothes back again and laid them out while the soldiers continued to sleep. And then they took the body out. So really he's dead and they stole his body. How ridiculous was that? And yet that was the story that was spread around and many, many people believed it. Do you know what I have found, brothers and sisters, and maybe you have found it as well? I have found in my life, as I have walked with God, and so I want to encourage you as you walk with God, I have found it is far easier to believe in the truth of Jesus than it is in the lies of the enemy as I go, as I walk further and further with Jesus, as I go along further and further in my life and open my heart to his word and let the Holy Spirit work in me, I have found more and more, oh my goodness, how can you believe, how can you believe that there is no creator? How can you believe that there is no God? It takes a lot more faith to believe that we are random chances in a great universe than it is to believe that there is a God. And science has shown that. Science is, and some of you that may be saying, are you sure of that? I'm so sure of that. Come and talk to me afterwards. We won't go into all the details now. But the people of that day and the disciples of that day, they had to have proof. They had to know because they were going to have to have a message to proclaim to an unbelieving and a hostile world. They were going to face people that had a lot of questions about what they were saying. How can you say that someone rose from the dead? Remember when Paul begins to preach this gospel later? People say, what is he babbling about? That's the word in Greek. What is he babbling about? Some Jew that has, ra that has, that has come back to life again? The Christianity and the truth that they were preaching was going to have to face hard questions. I want to tell you something this morning. You study the Word of God and you get the help of the Holy Spirit, but the truth of God and the Word of God will stand up 
to every hard question. It will. It will. You don't have to be afraid that what you believe and what you read in the Word of God is some weak, pitiful thing that you have to protect against the world because you know it might not hold up. It will stand. It will hold up. And if you say, well, I'm not sure that I challenge you this morning, get into the Word of God. Study the Word of God and study others who have studied the Word of God that, that talk about this is why you can believe what the Word of God says. That's on one part. But there's another part as well that we'll talk about in just a minute. You and I are not where the disciples were. And we're going to look at this a little bit further. The disciples were convinced by the convincing proofs of Jesus at that time. Right? You and I are a little bit stuck. We don't have the convincing proofs of Jesus before us, do we? Not in the same way that those disciples had. What are you and I going to do? How are you and I going to answer questions? How are you and I going to face a hostile world, an unbelieving world that says, how can you believe this? How can you whatever? What, what do we have to stand on? What is our foundation? In fact, go ahead and look at the, at the next, uh, at, click to the next slide. A foundation for faith. They had, as we read in Acts 1-3, Jesus himself giving many convincing proofs. What are you and I going to have? Because I haven't seen Jesus with my own eyes. I haven't touched him. I haven't heard him. I haven't seen him eat. I... Because that's one of the proofs, by the way, that they saw him eat. And we'll talk about that. I haven't heard his voice. I haven't, I haven't seen him with my own eyes. What convincing proof am I going to have? What is there going to be in my life that is a foundation for faith? Let me go ahead and tell you now. Go back and look at Acts 1.8. You will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be His witnesses, the witnesses of Jesus. That is one of the major things that the Holy Spirit will do in your life when He comes in, when He fills you and He transforms your life. He makes you a witness. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will take from what is mine. Let me paraphrase. He will take from what is mine and He will give it to you. That's what it says in John. That's the, the paraphrase. So the Holy Spirit comes into your life. You become a Christian. He starts to work in you. But there is the further experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which we will talk about not so much this morning, but in the weeks ahead. He comes in. He baptizes you. He fills you. He transforms your life. And then one of the things the Holy Spirit does in your life, in my life, is this. Though I am 2,000 years removed, though you are 2,000 years removed from the time that Jesus walked the dusty roads of Galilee and Jerusalem and Judea, the Holy Spirit is going to take what is of Jesus who is now in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, praying for me and praying for you. He's going to take Jesus and make Jesus real to me. He's going to make Jesus real to you. He's not only going to make Jesus real to you, he's going to make Jesus real in you, in you and me. And the same proofs that they had, convincing proofs, Jesus is alive. The Holy Spirit is going to do when he comes to do his work in your heart and life. He's going to do the same thing in you that Jesus did when he walked those 40 days when he was with the disciples. That is the work, brothers and sisters, of the Holy Spirit. That's why you want to give him room in your heart and life. That's why you want to say, oh God, I want more of your spirit. That's why whatever, you know, we're a mixed group of people here at church, whatever we understand about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, tongues, this, that, all of these things, here is one prayer you can always pray, always, whatever your background. God, I want more of you. Here's another prayer you can pray. God, I want everything you have for me. That's, those are two prayers you can pray, and God will answer those prayers. You don't, hold, you don't close any doors. You don't hold anything back. You say, God, whatever you have for me, I want. Whatever your word says, I accept. I open my heart and I open my life. And he will do his work, and he will give you all that he has for you. Now, all the way back to the disciples and the convincing proofs. Okay? Let's look at this word, proofs. They're going to have to have this 
And Luke is really careful. That's one of the definitions. Remember, he is a man of science, Dr. Luke, a man of detail, a man of great accuracy. And the word he used, pr proof, I'm not going to give you all the Greek or whatever, but the word as he used it, I'm not using the necessarily the, the words that we would use today in English or in other languages, but as it's used in the Greek, it means this, demonstrated decisive evidence. Jesus gave them more than a feeling. It was more than a hope. It was more than a dream. It was more than an idea. It was something that was demonstrated. It was decisive. It was convincing. It was convincing. Jesus did it. Why? He knew they needed it. He knew they had to have it. Same thing for you and same thing for me. If they were going to give this message to the world, they were going to lose their families, many of them. They were going to lose their livelihood, many of them. In some cases, they were going to give their lives for this message. They had to know it was true and it was real. Remember when Peter says, Master, we have left all to follow you. And they had, and they had. And so they're going to have to have a, I don't know if you, what do you, I don't know exactly what you want to call it, a gripping of their heart and of their life. And beloved brothers and sisters, frankly, I think that's what you and I need as well in this world. We need more than just, oh, a nice Sunday morning service. Wasn't that good this morning? I sure did like the music. That was great. I like that song. We haven't sung it in a while. Well, that was a good Sometimes people who don't have a church background will say to me, I really liked your talk. <laughs> and when somebody says that to me, it makes my heart go <laughs> just a little bit. Because I think, a talk? A talk? <laughs> because I really try to wait on the Lord and prepare and, and pray and be full of the Holy Spirit and know that what the Lord wants me to say, but that's okay. Anyhow. But... We've got to have more than a good talk on Sunday morning. Brothers and sisters, we have to have the truth of Jesus Christ gripping our hearts, our heads, our lives, transforming us. Because we face a world that is in many ways as difficult as the world that the first disciples fa faced. We really do. You know, what I just said to you, and that's in your notes, they're going to have to believe for themselves and they have to have a message to tell an unbelieving b world. And we've got to be convinced of the truth of Jesus in our heads and fully experience His trans transforming power in our lives. That's in your notes. So it's in our heads. And it's not just, oh, I've experienced Him, but it has to be a transforming experience in our lives. Because you and I also face a difficult world. Now, we may not give our lives for our faith, although there are countries where people are giving their lives for their faith. This morning, this morning, there are places in India where people are giving their lives because they have proclaimed the truth of Jesus. There are places in Pakistan this morning. There are places in North Korea. There are places just north of us. There are other places around the world. There are places in the Middle East and parts of Africa where people are giving their lives today, today for this. And you and I say this morning, well, my life, my Christian life, Pastor Jennifer, it's not really so dramatic. You know, I live here in Hong Kong. Brothers and sisters, when you go out from these doors this morning, you are going to family members right now who think you are crazy because you believe Jesus, who think you religious nut, have you lost your brain? Have you given up all this? Why are you, why are you, all that religious stuff? Why are you so religious? That's what they say, right? Why are you so religious? You're going to go out in your work and on the MTR and on the streets and with your employers. And you're going to face people who have hopeless lives, who are facing impossible situations, who have broken families and broken hearts and messed up minds, messed up minds this morning. 
and you're going to cross their path. And I want to tell you something this morning. Do you know why you are going to cross their path? Not just because there are so many of them out there and there are plenty of people out there just like that. But you're going to cross their path because you have Jesus this morning in you. And God wants you to share with them. And God wants you to show them. God wants you to display to them the transforming power of God and the ability to change a life that is broken and desperate and helpless. If you yourself are going through some of these things this morning, I urge you, you hold on to God and let God get you through it and then trust God to use the difficulty you have gone through to minister to other people. You and I are going to have to be convinced just as they were, de demonstrated decisive evidence of the truth of the transforming power of a Savior and a Lord who is alive who is alive, who is alive. You see, a lot of people will say to you when they find out you're a Christian, they will, t they will tell you this, oh, well that's good for you. How many people have ever said that to you? That's good for you. I'm glad, I'm glad that you have something you can believe in. As I told the first service, I just wanna hit people when they say something like that, partly because it's such a, Sorry, I don't want to offend anyone, but it's such a foolish thing to say. It's such a foolish thing to say. How many of you, just to feel a little more comforted, you want to believe in a lie just because it makes you feel better? You want to you want to believe in a lie? I don't want to believe in a lie. I don't care how I don't care how good it makes me feel. I want to believe in the truth. I want the foundation of my faith to be something that is proven, that there's a proof there. There's a proof there. And when you face people who say, "Well, that's good for you and I'm glad you I'm glad you have a belief." That's what they'll say. I'm glad that you have a belief. You and I have to have a convincing proof in our lives that shows it's not just a belief. It's not just my opinion because that's what the world will say. Well, you believe this and I believe that. There's got to be a convincing proof in your life, in your life that speaks to them and shows them Jesus is alive. He's not dead. It's not some religion from 2,000 years ago, but he is alive and well and powerful and moving and working and loving and able to change your life today, 2016, August 7th that he is real and he's relevant and there's only one way people are going to see that. They've got to see it in your life and there's only one way that can happen and that is if you and I are convinced. That is if you and I have the proof in our lives that Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive and that's going to happen one way and one way only. It's going to happen when the Holy Spirit comes upon me and I will be, have the power that He gives me and I will what? Be His witness. I will be His witness. That's what it means. That's why Acts 1-8 is still relevant for you this morning and relevant for me this morning. It's not just for those disciples. So we look at this and we see the convincing proofs that He gave those first disciples. But the Holy Spirit brings Jesus and convinces, gives convincing proofs to us and then through us to this world. Amen? That's how it has to be. Now, what did Jesus do? What convincing proofs did He give them to make them know this is really Jesus? What's the first one? He appeared to them. Do you know what this word appeared is? I won't go into all the Greek, and you already know I'm not a Greek scholar, I just, scholar, I just study. This word appeared has the same root word, it's from the word that we get, those of us that have glasses, ophthalmology and optics and all of the, those words that have to do, it has to do with our eyeballs, okay? It has to do with our eyeballs. And so if you want to think of it, for 40 days, Jesus let the disciples 
eyeball him, if you want to think of it. That, that's a, that's a, a, a casual translation, but that's really what it means. He wanted them to see he's there. He's there. So first proof, he appeared to them. What are some of the appearances of Jesus? Anybody? There are at least 10 or 11 recorded appearances. There would Probably there would have been more, but these are the ones that are recorded. Anybody? Just name one. Keith? In, in the room that night, right? And they were so hard to believe, weren't they? W weren't they? They couldn't really believe. It can't be Jesus. It can't be Jesus. We read that. And he had to show them him. And then, and, then he, and then he ate with them as well. So in the room that night. And they were all slow to believe. What are some other appearances? Okay, when they were fishing. Also related to food, wasn't it? Up in Galilee in the early morning hours. And I love the... The non-spiritual part about that. Think about that with me, brothers and sisters. Very non-spiritual. The disciples, about seven of them, are out fishing in Galilee, those that were fishermen. Jesus, early morning hours, comes to the side of the lake, builds a fire. Ooh, ghosts don't do that, do they? <laughs> Flesh and blood. Built a fire, cooked a meal. Bread and fish. For them, so and he appeared to them. Then, can you think of some other appearances? Okay, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Here's another really practical one. He was walking. He was not floating two feet above the ground like a ghost or an apparition of some sort or a hallucination. He walked with them. He walked with them. Can you think of some other appearances? Very first appearance to Mary Magdalene in the garden early in the morning. And of course the disciples dismissed it because they said, women, you know. Hmm. I, I wonder if Mary Magdalene said, told you so. <laughs> I, she may have. She may have. And then the other women as well. Mary Magdalene and then the other women. And, and many other ones as well without going into all of the details. And so first proof. He appeared to them. What's the second proof? He spoke to them. It's recorded in all of the Gospels, the end chapters of all of the Gospels. He spoke to them. So you read the, ending, the endings of the Gospels. He spoke to them, and then it's recorded in Acts. He said this. He said that. It wasn't an impression on their hearts. It wasn't a, I feel that Jesus might be saying this. They heard with physical ears the words of Jesus. All of them heard. It was recorded. So there's another proof. He spoke to them. What else? One more, one more proof. He did what? He, he ate with them. He ate with them. Now before you say, Pastor Jennifer, that's not very spiritual. Do we really have to talk about that very much? Yes, we do. Do you know why I think we should talk about it? Because if you will read the Gospels at the end, and then the beginning of Acts, you will see how many times Jesus ate with them over a meal. And then in the passage that we read, um, so you've got this. Uh, go, go ahead and let's look again at the next slide, slide four. What do we say? What does, he, what, what does he do finally to convince them? They still think he's a ghost. What is? They have seen him, number one. They have heard him. He has even said, touch me. What is the final convincing proof that he gives them? What? Give me some food. Give me some food. And you know what I love about this? I really do. The, Luke writes, remember I told you he's a very, he's a very specific and, and, and detailed writer? Luke does not say, and they gave him some food to eat. What does Luke say? They gave him some what? Broiled, Broiled fish. <laughs> okay. Bro they, he didn't even say they gave him some fish. He, they, he says exactly what type of fish, how it was prepared. It was broiled. It was broiled fish. And so, at least for the Jewish understanding, if he's eating, so they saw him take food. They saw him put it in his mouth. They saw him chew. They saw him swallow. And we kind of think, yes. They had to be convinced. They had to be convinced. And if you'll see, several times more, he, talk, he talks about food to convince them. And it's time it's almost time to stop. And as you can look at your notes, we still have a long way to go. But look at what your notes say right here. The reason we're going into all of this is because just as Jesus gave convincing proofs to the disciples that he was alive, 
so too through the Holy Spirit today. Jesus gives you and me convincing proof in our heads because he gives us that brain that we have. That brain, you know, that we ask all the questions with, God gave us that. And with our hearts, that we might know that we know that we know that we have a foundation for our faith. Look at what it says on our notes. The early Christians did not believe in the resurrection of Christ because they could not find his dead body. They believed because they found a living Christ. A living Christ. Brothers and sisters, when people see you and hear you and are around you day after day, I ask you what they will find. Will they find a dead religion, a church membership, or will they find in you and in me the living Christ? A living Christ and it will be a proof it will be a convincing proof a convincing proof God we thank you for the book of Acts we thank you that you inspired Luke to write as he did help us we pray Jesus just as you gave convincing proofs to those first disciples and the early Christians who are going to go out and spread your word and be your witness. May you, oh Jesus, through the power, the indwelling, empowering, filling, baptizing Holy Spirit, so transform our lives that you too are the living Lord, a risen Jesus in our lives. For us, for, for ourselves, Lord, and for those that we will face today in our families, in our workplaces, in the world around us. We present ourselves to you. God, we want everything you have for us. We do not want to be complacent Christians. We thank you for what you have done in our lives, but Lord, we don't want to stop there. We know that you have more for us, and so we give you more of ourselves as well. May we be proofs of you, O oh living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. amen.